This chapter that I'm starting right now covers nuclear chemistry, which I find to be one of the most fascinating topics of the entire year of general chemistry that we cover. I'm not a nuclear chemist or a nuclear physicist. This is not my area of specialty. But I can tell you that as I delve into un at least understanding or teaching the theoretical underpinnings of this topic, I find them to be absolutely fascinating. Now, I realize that when we think of the word nuclear, we think of nuclear bombs, which are you know, generally bad things, or we think of nuclear reactors or nuclear power plants or nuclear waste or other things. In effect, we think of a lot of things that often have a lot of negative connotations. But the point is, if you actually study the theories behind what's going on in the world of nuclear chemistry, I hope that you'll find that they're as fascinating as I do, because this is a realm that to me seems like almost an undiscovered country, a, a universe that is so deep and mysterious in a lot of ways that you could potentially do research in it for countless amounts of time and continue to be learning things. With that highbrow approach, I'd like to begin, of course, with a hilarious chemistry cat of the day. This one says, you mean that Electron traveled all by himself to that other solution? He has got a lot of potential. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to also share with you a molecule of the day. This one comes from our ACS, or American Chemical Society Information Portal. It says, Keitsu O'Hara and co-workers at the University of Tokyo discovered Z5 tetradecene one all a straight-chain unsaturated alcohol, whose structure is shown here, by the way, while investigating the role of a mysterious mouse odor receptor. When the researchers exposed the receptor to various mouse fluids, they found that a component of male mouse urine gave positive results. Eventually, they identified Z5 tetradecene one all as a receptor binder and discovered that it attracts female mice to male urine. Isn't that exciting? And it has the word urine in it. After this lecture, the series of lectures that we'll be covering, uh, sections 1 through 4, chapter 21, from our text, you guys should be able to determine an element's number of protons, electrons, and neutrons from its atomic symbol, pronounce the word nuclear correctly, <laughs> determine and balance the following types of nuclear reactions, alpha emission, beta emission, gamma emission, positron emission, and electron capture, describe patterns of nuclear stability, Know what nuclear transmutations are and some things they're used for, and understand how radiometric dating works and be able to perform rudimentary radiometric calculations. That's the lineup. Let's get started. Now, all energy for life on Earth ultimately originates from the sun. That's probably not news to you, but it's true. But where does the sun get its energy? The answer is from nuclear reactions. Inside our sun, the nuclei of hydrogen atoms are fused together to form helium, which releases a huge amount of energy. This process is called nuclear fusion. Now, when a star's nuclear fuel supply runs out, its helium atoms gradually fuse together to make heavier elements, and the star then goes supernova. Supernova explosions in our universe are responsible for creating all naturally occurring elements that are heavier than nickel. So yes, as far as we know, our sun actually does have an estimated lifespan and will eventually go supernova and die. That lifespan is, I think, like estimated to be about 500 million years from now or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, it's long enough in the future that you and I probably won't have to worry about it. <laughs> so that's good news, right? All right. So in this chapter, we'll learn about the amazing world of nuclear chemistry. Before beginning, however, I want to show you a very appropriate video clip from The Simpsons. Good morning and welcome to Nuclear Physics 101. I see a lot of new faces, but you know the old saying, out with the old, in with the nucleus. Now we'll begin by... Oops. <laughs> after every class. Do we have to? No. Then kiss my Kirby butt. Goodbye. <laughs> now, every chemical reaction we've discussed so far this year, both semesters, has involved the sharing, exchange, or transfer of electrons, which are located in the orbitals that surround the atom's nuclei. Now, in contrast with these traditional chemical reactions, which just involve electrons, nuclear reactions involve the subatomic particles found inside the atom's nuclei. These subatomic particles, called nucleons, consist mainly of protons and neutrons, though we'll learn today that there are actually other nucleons as well. 
Before getting into nuclear reactions, however, I want to review something I taught you way back in Chapter 2's coverage of atomic symbols. And that is this. We use abbreviations called atomic symbols to describe elements. Here is the symbol for magnesium. You'll notice, of course, that the atomic number, this 12 in the lower left-hand corner of this box, corresponds to the box in which this element appears on the periodic table. This atomic number is always the same for all elements that have the same letter symbol. In other words, all magnesium atoms have an atomic number of 12. Also, the atomic number is equal to the number of protons that that element has, which means that all magnesium atoms have 12 protons. You can't change the number of protons without changing the identity of the element. Thus, the number of protons in a given element never changes. Now, the mass number, which is this number in the upper left-hand corner of this box, can change for different elements with the same letter symbol. The mass number is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And please remember that. So it would follow that a magnesium 24 atom has 12 protons and 12 neutrons because it weighs 24. But not all magnesium atoms weigh 24. Some weigh 23 and some weigh 25. A magnesium 25 atom then has 12 protons and 13 neutrons because 12 plus 13 equals 25. A magnesium-23 atom, in contrast, has 12 protons and 11 neutrons because 12 plus 11 equals 23. Make sense? I hope. But it begs the question, how can some magnesium atoms have 13 neutrons while others have 12 and others have 11? The answer is isotopes. So isotopes are different atoms with the same atomic number but different masses. This happens when two otherwise identical atoms have different numbers of neutrons in their nuclei or nucleuses. Yeah, it's nuclei. <laughs> For example, most carbon atoms have six neutrons. We call these carbon-12 or C12 atoms because they weigh 12 atomic mass units. Because six neutrons plus six protons equals 12. Other carbon atoms, however, have seven neutrons. These are called carbon-13 or C13 atoms because they weigh 13 AMUs. We would say then that carbon-12 and carbon-13 atoms are different isotopes of carbon. All of these, however, have the same atomic number six and the same number of protons. Six. Once again then, although you can change an element's number of electrons and neutrons without changing which element it is, you cannot do that for protons. For example, if we changed a carbon atom's number of protons to seven, it would no longer be carbon. It would now be nitrogen. That takes us to some beautiful review problems from Chapter 2. Now, I realize that right now we're in Chapter 21, so really, once again, this is totally a review. But I hope that you'll take it seriously and make sure that you know how to do it. Here we go. First question says, magnesium has three isotopes with mass numbers of 24, 25, and 26. I want you to write the complete chemical symbol with superscript and subscript for each of these isotopes. And then answer to me, okay, I'm not actually listening because this is a recording, but answer to yourself, I suppose, how many neutrons are there in each atom of these isotopes? Separately, give the, uh, give the chemical symbol, including superscript indicating mass number four, First, the ion with 22 protons, 26 neutrons, and 19 electrons. And next, the isotope of platinum that contains 118 neutrons. Here's another one that's actually from this chapter. In the symbol below, okay, it's not really below, it's over here to the side, this X with a 13 and a 6 there. X is which element? Next, which species has 16 protons? And next... Which species here has 54 electrons? And that's pretty much it. I'm, of course, not going to answer any of these for you here, but invite you to do it on your own time. For students who are taking this class from me, I'll help you with it if you need it in class. That takes us to the end of this first lecture video. Please stay tuned to the next one in which I'll begin teaching you about nuclear reactions. Until next time, my beloved students, have an enjoyable rest of your day.